That's it. All right. What is our Torah portion today? Bo. And what does bo mean? So why does it say go? Think about it. Look at the, when you look at the, the Hebrew of the, the first part of this Torah portion, it's not, it's go. It's not come. God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh. Well, we're going to look at that here in just a minute. But to begin with, in this Torah portion, seven of the 10 plagues have already gone by. And so this Torah portion covers the last three plagues. Okay, what are they? Locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. So what happens in this Torah portion, the mighty Egyptian uh, empire is brought to its knees. Okay, I mean, I, I think it's the same thing. God is going to bring every nation to its knees. I don't care how mighty every nation thinks it is. God's going to take them all down to their knees. How do I know? It says every knee will bow. <laughs> every knee is going to bow. And I think that includes every nation. All their idols uh, will be crushed. Uh, we see in this Torah portion that the Jews now collect their long overdue paychecks for all their hard work over the last 215 years uh, in Egypt. But now let me ask you something. What was the purpose of leaving Egypt? What was the purpose of God bringing Israel out of Egypt? Uh, I mean, they were slaves to Egypt. Okay, so God is making them no longer slaves of Egypt. Instead, they're his slaves. Slavery to slavery, in one sense. Now they have to be God's servants. So where's the freedom? They're still slaves. Only now they're slaves to God. Well, here's the bigger question. We all know the answer to that, really. But here's the bigger question. Why not serve God in Egypt? Could they serve God in Egypt? I mean, you know... I think the big thing is what we call today assimilation. We believe we can serve God along with all the other gods. You know, and that I believe is what's gonna happen in these last days with the Antichrist. He's gonna say, you can keep your God, put your Jesus in your pocket, pull him out, whatever you want, I don't care. You just have to serve me also. So, and I think that's the big problem with serving God in Egypt. He becomes one of many. He wants to be the one and only. And so he can't do that in Egypt. This is why you don't get saved in your sins. You get saved from your sins. We want to be saved in our sins. We love them too much. But God wants to save us out of our sins. Does that make sense? Most people don't want to be saved from their sins. They enjoy them. They just want to be saved from the consequence of their sin. But that's not how it works. That's right. Okay. Here's the thing. How many of you like going boating? How about out on the ocean on a cruise ship or something? A lot of fun. But guess what? You can't enjoy the freedom of the high seas if you don't have a navigational fix. If you're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you don't know north, south, east, west, up or down, you're going to be basically floundering. Um, every intelligent person understands that without some navigational fix, uh, provided by a compass, we're just going to sail in circles. And that's what much of humanity does because they don't have the Torah as their fix. They, we're going in circles. We're just going round and round. Uh, and to me, the Torah is the compass of life. Uh, and so when we have the Torah, we're able to stay on target. Without the Torah, we're just going to be shooting crazy or whatever and, and not know where we're going. So without the Torah's guidance and direction, we're going to be lost in these stormy seas that we find ourselves in and in all of the confusion. So we have to have a spiritual guidance system as well. Otherwise, we're just going to aimlessly go through life. We all try to think, if I just had this one thing, life would be perfect. That doesn't work, guys. Solomon had everything. He had all the wealth. He had all the power. I mean, he, he had the fame, fortune, everything, and he wasn't happy. In Ecclesiastes, he said, I hate him life. 
be, because there has to be purpose with life. What's the purpose? Uh, and I think what's interesting, Ecclesiastes 3 says God created everything on purpose, which means he created you on purpose. Even you were created on purpose. Uh, and I think that's what everyone looks for in the meaning of life is why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? And you're not going to find it in being wealthy. You're not going to find it in being powerful. You're not going to, you know, that's what all, but look what happens to these crazy people that make all this money. They all get on drugs. I don't care if they're sports or politicians or the wealthiest people in the world, like with this Bitcoin and all this other garbage. They all, none of them are happy. I try to learn from others' mistakes. I don't want to make them all myself, you know. And, and so when I see all these people that, are, that actually achieve, they have all the power, they have all the fame, they have all the fortune, and they're completely miserable. That tells me, why do I want to go after that? The key always is the relationship. It's always about the relationship. Uh, as a matter of fact, many people don't realize this, but Torah was mistranslated. The Hebrew word Torah doesn't mean law. Torah means instruction. We know from 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for instruction. It's like the operation manual of your car. That you have this operation manual, tells you how to run it so it will last longer. And it's an operation manual for life. And what does most of Christianity people do? They throw it out. Oh, I'm just going to do it. How many men don't like to follow directions when they do something? They just want, they just want to do it, you know? Well, that's, uh, this is the thing, the problem with mankind. We don't want to pay attention to the operation manual and think we can do a better job than the designer. Yeah. Okay, moving on. All right. Now, um, let's look at Exodus 10.1. The Lord said to Moses, not come, but Go to Pharaoh. I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I might show these my signs before him. Okay. The reason why God did not say, uh, the reason why God said, let's go to Pharaoh rather than just come to Pharaoh. He, what he's saying is, I want you to come along with me. I'm going to. If he, he, it's like God saying, here, you go to Pharaoh. No, come along with me. I'm going to go see Pharaoh. So you come along as well. That's basically what this is saying. And, and what he's saying to uh, Moses is, watch this. It's like he's in an excited relationship. And he says, go see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. Come along. And uh, the last plagues, if you remember that chart from last week, these are all to demonstrate God's power. The first seven plagues have already conveyed that there is a God in heaven, that he exists, number one, and number two, he is involved with what happens on earth. What makes these last three plagues different or stand out even more powerfully is this. It's our next verse, Exodus 10, verse two. In most Bibles, it says, and that you may recount, but it actually a better Hebrew translation, this is in order. I'm doing this in order that you can recount in the ears of your son and your son's sons what things that I've worked in Egypt by my signs, which I have done among them. But look at this. It's that you may know how I am the Lord. It's not that you may know I'm the Lord, but I want you to know how I am. Okay? Well, look at what I'm going to do. I want you to know how I do this. Often, you know, they say uh, you give a person to fish, eat for a day, teach them how to fish, eat for a lifetime. Well, God says, look, I don't want you just to see what I'm doing. You have to do more than see it. I want you to see how I'm doing it. Okay, well, um, the purpose of the last plagues wasn't to show the Egyptians of God's dominance, because that was already obvious. It was that our children may know, number one, God is saying, I want to show you how I'm doing this, because I want, this is not for the Egypt, this is for you, Israel. And he's saying that I want you to know that you are loved, uh, just as our parents know that they are loved and appreciated for everything they've done for us. So God is saying, I have worked. Now, what's interesting in, how, in the Hebrew where it says how I have worked, what that implies is, I want you to see how I made the Egyptians a laughing stock. You know, it's, it's just, you know, I want you to know how they are just a toy. They're not so powerful. You think the devil's so powerful. 
God says, no, he's a, he's, I play with him. He's a little toy. Okay, so God wanted them to realize naturally Egypt seems so powerful and so dominant, just like we think of, or like every nation, especially in autocratic nations, that their government is so powerful. What can we do? Well, guess what? They're toys in God's hands. Look at verse three and four. Moses and Aaron come into Pharaoh and said, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? And then he says this, let my people go that they may serve me. Else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I'm going to bring locusts on your coast. I don't know if you know that, but right now there's a huge swarm uh, that's just bigger than ever that's going around the world of these cicadas. Okay, Exodus 10, 6. God says these locusts are going to fill your houses and, and the houses of all your servants, the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your father or your father's father's have ever seen since the day they were on the earth to this day. And then he turns himself and went out from Pharaoh. Now, it's very important that he says he turns himself. You know why? How often do you know, don't you dare turn your back on the king? You don't turn your back on the king. And Moses just turns himself around, ha, 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 and he walks out. You know, even when you go to Israel to the Western Wall, when you're praying at the Western Wall, uh, they say to step back three steps before you turn. Don't just turn your back on God and go on. You're supposed to walk backwards about three steps before you turn. Well, this is a concept been going on forever. Well, how humiliating for Pharaoh in front of all of his servants, he turns his back on him and thumbs his nose at him and says, see you tomorrow. And um, look at Exodus 10, seven. So what happens? Pharaoh's servants say to Pharaoh, how long is this man gonna be a snare to us? Let the people go that they can serve the Lord their God. Don't you know Egypt is destroyed? Well, now he's really humiliated. Even his servants are saying, you know, there's nothing you can do, boss. Uh, So look at verse eight and nine. So what did they do? They ran back out of the house. They grabbed uh, Moses and Aaron and told him to come back in. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh. And now Pharaoh says to them, fine, go serve the Lord your God. But who's going? And Moses says, well, we're going to go with everybody, our young, our old, our sons, our daughters. We're even taking our flocks and our herds, but we have to hold a feast to the Lord. See, so what is happening here when you think about reality, Pharaoh's trying to save face. As you know, in any negotiations, if you're trying to negotiate between war, even Russia and Ukraine or whatever's going on, you want it, the way you resolve it is so everyone can do what is called saving face. Okay, well here... Pharaoh's trying to save face in front of Moses. So he's, okay, I'll let you go, but I'm going to limit who goes. Well, uh, look at Genesis 50 verse 8 for a minute. It says, all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. This is talking about when they went to bury Jacob. Remember, Jacob dies, blesses all the tribes, but he wanted to be buried in Israel. So what happens? Joseph and his brothers that are still alive, they all go to Israel to bury Jacob, but they leave behind their little ones, their flocks, their herds in the land of Goshen. So this Pharaoh's thinking, hey, you know, you left them behind. Why don't you go do your thing and you leave your little ones behind uh, and your hawks and your fur, uh, herds because he wanted to make sure they would come back. Okay, uh, look at Exodus 10, 10, 11. Pharaoh says to Moses, basically, God help you. The Lord be with you. If I ever let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you were asking. I think he ought to know what he was asking. Uh, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Uh, so notice what he's wanting. He wants to keep the children. To this day, the battle is always for the children, the media, education. Look at this woke school system that we have. That is so horrible. I know an individual who is about to have his uh, daughter taken away, okay, if he doesn't allow them to seek gender change. I mean, they're literally trying to take your kids away if you don't agree to their teachings. 
It's insanity. Okay, Exodus 10, 20 through 23. The Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. He wouldn't let the children of Israel go. And what does the Lord say to Moses? Stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which can be felt. Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three old days. They didn't see one another. They didn't rise from their place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Isn't that cool? I think it's amazing. Uh, when you, back then, they didn't have electricity. There wasn't no Puget power, okay? The only power they had was oil lamps. Why couldn't their lamps light? That was the, I mean, in Israel, they were able, they, both sides had oil in their lamps. But for some reason, Israel's lamps would light and their lamps wouldn't light. They got matches, they got oil. I want you to really think how miraculous this is. It's not like their battery went dead on the flashlight, okay? It is totally dead. The only form of light is a match and the oil in the lamp. And Israel's lamps would light, but theirs wouldn't. I, I, you know, that is just weird. Okay. Exodus 11, 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Oh my goodness, this is more humiliation for Pharaoh. Pharaoh's just being so humiliated that his servants and people respect Moses more than him. Let's go to verse 4 through 7 of Exodus 11. So Moses said, thus saith the Lord, about midnight. I'm going to go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt is going to die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who's behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And that says there will be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there's never been, nor ever will be again. And then it says, a dog will not even growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast. But now look, it's so that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. This isn't for Egypt to know. God wanted Israel to know that he's the one who makes a distinction between light and darkness. Genesis 1, he separated the light from the darkness. It's the same thing here. He wants everyone to know he's the one who separates good from evil, light from darkness, life from death. He is the one who makes the distinction you can find that very important in the second half. And now, <laughs> uh, talk about more humiliation. Moses tells Pharaoh, we're in Exodus 11, verse 8. He says, all of your servants are going to come down to me, and they're going to bow down themselves to me, saying, get you out of here, and all the people that follow you, and after that, then I'll go. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. Uh, Exodus 12, 1 through 3. Oh, that, this kind of reminds me too. You know, Pharaoh wanted them to stay. And so Moses says, I'm not going until I'm told to go. In other words, Moses could have said, okay, I'm going. He said, no, I'm not going to go until you tell me to go. Now that's some chutzpah. I mean, he's been wanting to go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. And then he says, but I'm not going until you tell me to go. Uh, he's, who's in charge here? And I think it's interesting. What does Yeshua say in the Gospels? I'm not coming until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's the same thing. I want to come, but I'm not going to come until you ask me. I mean, do you see the parallel here? It's incredible. Okay, so Exodus 12, 1 through 3. The Lord tells Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It'll be the first month of the year. And what day is that? Nisan 1. Okay, that's exactly right. And then he says, On the 10th day of this month, 
Everyone is to take a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Do you know this is the first and only commandment in the Torah that was given in Egypt? This wasn't given at Mount Sinai. This wasn't after they've left. There was only one commandment given to them in Egypt, and that is, I'm giving you a calendar to go by. Okay, and this is why we need to be on God's calendar. He gave it to the world in Genesis 1 and, or 2, and uh, well, I guess 1 and 2, but he also was giving it to Israel. He's saying, look, you need to go by my calendar. If you want to be redeemed, you have to begin by being on my calendar. Okay, so what secured a new relationship between God and the people was the establishing of the calendar, which is a time that is set apart by God for God. Now, as you know, as slaves, time belongs to the master, not to the slave. He tells you when to go to bed. He tells you when to get up. Time belongs to the master when you're a slave. They did not have the freedom to act as they pleased when they pleased as slaves. But now, if they just submitted to God's calendar, they would experience freedom. The Bible says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? If you want to walk with God, you got to be in his day timer. You got to be on his calendar. The significance is that Israel had to reckon the time of redemption as a new beginning. They were born again. These were like the firstborn. Okay. I have a lot to cover. And uh, is my time up or do I have 10 more minutes? I'm trying to remember. 10 more minutes? Okay, good. All right. Hope I'm not boring you. Okay. Exodus 12, 7 and 8. God says you're to take the blood and you're to strike it on the two side posts on the upper door posts of the house wherein you will eat it and they shall eat the flesh that night roasted with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs. They will eat it. Okay. So it emerges, as I said last week, that the journey of redemption begins with a big national cookout. Yay! It's like the 4th of July. Independence, fireworks, barbecue, all of this kind of thing. Uh, it's called the Passover barbecue. The Torah continues with its recipe and cooking plan. They weren't allowed to cut it up, whereby be passed off as something else. Okay, he wanted to make sure everyone knew it was a lamb that was being sacrificed. It had to be barbecued whole. And then it seems that the placement of blood on the doorpost is supposed to serve as some kind of a strategic tracking system that will alert God to Jewish occupancy. Does our all-knowing God really need a tracking system? No. Okay, so what's the purpose? What is the purpose of all this? Well, first off, look at Exodus 12, 12. God says, I'm going to go through the land of Egypt that night. I'm going to smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And look at this. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment for I am the Lord. Okay. God, all the plagues that have been going on, everything is against the gods of Egypt. Now, here's what many Christians don't realize. To the Egyptians, the killing of a lamb was a desecration of their religion. Okay. It's like uh, going in front, going to Iran and tearing up the Koran and throwing it in pieces. They will not be pleased. Okay. To the Egyptians, this was a direct challenge to their gods. Because Nisan, if you're in Egypt, you look up in the sky, the constellation Aries or the lamb is the constellation that's there. And when it is the full moon, they believe their lamb is at the apex of its power. And God is about to destroy their lamb and say, it's my lamb that you better be worshiping, not yours. Okay. Uh, let me see what I got here. Okay, here we go. So here they are. In the bottom right corner is they're barbecuing the Passover lamb. It's a full moon. There is Aries up there. Here, let me show it to you. There is Aries. That's what's up in the sky. All the Egyptians are seeing this and they're roasting their God for heaven's sake. All right, here it is, whole. Everyone has to see it and everyone gets to smell it as well. 
So all this barbecuing going over all of Egypt, we're barbecuing your God. Okay. So Aries is always visible over Egypt from about March 21st to about April 19th. Okay. So this is, it's, God is coordinating all of this. This is how you know there's a God. I mean, he's combining astronomy and uh, everything together. And what many people don't realize, the entire timeline for all 10 plagues was only five weeks. That's it. Five weeks. Uh, and it's easy to prove. But what is the first plague? The first plague is against the Nile. The Nile turns to blood. Happy was the Nile God. And so turning the Nile to blood symbolized the death of this God. The next God was the frog goddess called Hecate. Because the Egyptians saw that there were many frogs all appearing from the Nile, they associated the frog with fertility and the resurrection. So God says, you like frogs? I'll give you frogs. You know, and, and they all die, symbolizing the death of the frog God. Okay, now uh, they get frogs everywhere. Geb was the God of the earth. Earthquakes were believed to be the laughter of Geb. So what does God do? He takes the earth, the dust of the earth, and he turns it into lice, lice everywhere. Okay, then there was another God named Shu. Shu was the God of dry air, wind, and the atmosphere. They believed that uh, Shu was the one who held the sky off of the earth, allowing life to flourish in Egypt with his breath of life. So what does he do? He brings swarms of insects. Check this out. Then the next God they served was Apis. So what does God do? It was the cow God. It's the death of all the livestock. Then what do we see? Heka. Heka was the God of magic and medicine. To the ancient Egyptians, they were one and the same. Uh, it was a man carrying a magic staff and knife, the, tool of a, uh, the tools of a healer. So God brings a plague of boils and he says, heal this sucker. Okay, so we got all these boils breaking out. Uh, and this just shows that they have no power. Well, the next God is really crazy. The, the name is Nut. And it was the God of the firmament who protects people from the heavens. So what does God do? He brings hailstones and fire. Now what are you going to do about this? Well, then now comes the Torah portion. Men was the God of the harvest. The Egyptian harvest festival in Egypt was a celebration of the springtime harvest. Uh, it was dedicated to their God of vegetation and fertility. The harvest. So what does God do? He brings locusts to eat all of the harvest. Okay, come on. If you're a God, protect this. Then we have Ra, who was the Egyptian sun god who brought life. And so what does he do? He brings the plague of darkness. Now, Amun-Ra was believed to have been the creator of mankind. And so here, the plague is the death of the firstborn. All right. So this is what happens. So what does God tell them to do? Look at Exodus 12, 13. He says, the blood will be a what? A sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over you and let the plague not come to you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim, which means Egypt. Now, there's an interesting anomaly about that word in Hebrew you do not see in English at all. In Genesis uh, Right here, let me just show you. Uh, the, one of the, there's many words for sign. Uh, one of the words is Aleph Vav Tav, Ot. But this time, they're just putting the Aleph Tav. The Hebrew word for sign here is the Aleph Tav. That is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. They're saying this is symbolically God's blood that's being shed. Right here in Genesis 12. Uh, uh, 13. Okay. Um, look at Exodus 12, 14. This day will be to you for a memorial and you'll keep it a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations. You keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. You know, I think of Memorial Day, it means all those who died. And here they're keeping the memorial of all the firstborn dying, uh, you know, every year, which is to remind them too, that God's firstborn also passing. I mean, it's incredible. 
Um, let me see where I'm at. Yeah, it's to be a memorial. Keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And then, um, you know what the word forever is in Hebrew? It's olam. And olam means to the vanishing point. In other words, it's out of time out of mind, eternity. The word memento in Hebrew is zikron, and it means to mark something so that it is recognizable. Okay, mark it so it's recognizable. Because how many of you know, especially if you go to a trip to Israel, you have all these memories that soon fade. <laughs> okay, so or wherever you do. So he wants us to mark it so it's always recognizable, to remember they're to remember God's salvation from slavery. Uh, we're to remember the blood of the lamb that redeemed Israel uh, from uh, all of us from the slavery to the world. And then what do we find? Exodus 12, 29 and 30. It came to pass at midnight that the Lord smote all of the firstborn. We find that there was a great cry in Egypt because there was not even a one house where there wasn't someone who died. Well, I think midnight is very fascinating. Because in Job 34, 20, he says, in a moment they die, even at midnight. In Psalm 119, 61 through 63, the bands of the wicked haven't closed me, but I've not forgotten your law. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you. Uh, do you know how David rose at midnight? Do you remember what I told you? Here he says, at midnight, how does he know? Okay, if you're sound asleep, exactly right. How many of you know David played a harp? They said he opened his window and would have put his harp in the window and the spirit would wind would move through the harp and it'd start playing and he would hear it. And that was his alarm when the spirit would move through the wind causing the harp to play. And then he would get up and play it. Uh, look at Judges uh, 16.3. Samson lay until midnight. Ruth 3.8. It came to pass at midnight. And Matthew 25. The foolish virgins. It was at midnight. There was a cry. Okay, at midnight is, uh, you know, no one knows the day or the hour, they say. Well, at midnight, my goodness, it's all around the world. You have days and nights at one time, and it's all different days and nights. If it comes at midnight, well, no one's going to know the day. All right, uh, and Exodus 12, 43 through 46, uh, due to lack of time we're running out, at, at the very bottom, not one bone was to be broken of the Passover lamb. And what do we see in John 19, 3, 36? Everything that done to Yeshua was so scripture would be fulfilled that not a bone would be broken, which also tells me why when you see the pictures of the nails going through the hand, that's wrong. It's through the wrist. Okay, many bones would be broken if it was through the hand. And the nail went through the wrist. Okay, um, Exodus 13, 3 through 5, Moses says, remember this day that you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and it was by a strong hand of the Lord that you were able to come out. Um, and then look at Luke 22. What does Messiah say at the Last Supper? He said, do this in remembrance of me. How many is familiar with that verse? When he said, do this, what was he talking about? The Passover. He wasn't talking about communion. It's not communion. He said, don't do this every week in remembrance of me. Do this every year in remembrance of me. Okay, so the single purpose of the Passover Seder is to transmit the story of God's redemption to the next generation. That's what the purpose is. The next generation needs to know. I mean, this has been going on for 3,500 years and we still talk about it. The main reason why is because every generation is told about it. Um, Let's go to John 19, 31 through 34. Here it was the day of preparation. The Jewish people did not want the bodies to remain on the cross during the day of Shabbat. And that's not talking about Saturday. The first day of, pa of unleavened bread is a Shabbat. So if Nisan 14 is on a Wednesday, Thursday's a Shabbat. If Nisan 14 is on a Thursday, Friday's a Shabbat. They'll have two Shabbats in a row. Okay, so this is not talking about Saturday. It says, the, after all, that Shabbat was a solemn feast day. That refers to Nisan 15, the first day of unleavened bread, which isn't Saturday. 
Okay, this is referring to a nut. You can have four Shabbats in two weeks. It happens every year around Passover and Tabernacles because the first day and the last day are both Shabbats. So you'll have four Shabbats in two weeks. Okay, uh, let's look at the last verse, Leviticus 23, four through six. These are the fixed feasts of the Lord. Okay, so what does fixed mean? Fixed. <laughs> it ain't going nowhere. All right, and yet, you know, right now, within most of Christianity, they will celebrate the resurrection a month before he even dies. How do you celebrate the resurrection a month before he dies? Because they're not using God's fixed calendar. They're using the one that they made up. Okay, it says right here, in the first month, the 14th day of the month at nightfall is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you'll eat unleavened bread. Passover is not a Sabbath. The day after is a Sabbath. So like I said, a Passover falls on a Wednesday, the Thursday is a Sabbath, and then Saturday's a Sabbath. But the problem, like I said, with much of Christianity, because they don't want anything to do with the Bible uh, as far as God's feast days, because they think they're Jewish feast days, they're anti-Semitic, so we don't want nothing to do with it. No, they were God's feast days from the very beginning, and he let the Jews in on it, his calendar, and then he let the Gentiles in on his calendar, but we're too fixed on the pagan solar calendar. Okay, Muslims use a lunar calendar only. America and Iran use the same calendar too, totally solar. We're on the Iranian calendar, for heaven's sake. It, they both use solar calendars. Only the, now, China uses a solar lunar calendar, but it's got nothing to do with the creator of heaven and earth. This is why we gotta be on God's solar lunar calendar, and then you'll realize that it's on Nissan 14, not ER 28, because that's what happens. They, we, uh, most of Christianity celebrates the feast on the wrong day. All right, with that, let's stand. And after I pray, we'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back. We'll have some worship. And then you got to put up with me again. Amen. Avino Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. We know it's alive. It's not just history. It's past. It's present. It's future. I pray it comes alive in each one of our hearts, that each one of us will strive to draw close to you. We don't want to use you. Uh, and pull you out when we need you. You're our Abba, you're our Father, you're the, you want a relationship with us. So I just pray, Lord, that each and every one who's listening would draw closer to you uh, and hear your heartbeat. So Father, we just thank you for all of those that uh, donate uh, to your ministry right here. Father, uh, we want to be a light to the nations for your sake, not for our sake. It's not about us, it's all about you, uh, giving you all the glory and the, all the honor that you so deserve. Uh, so, Father, we just thank you for all those who give into this ministry from all over the world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. We're going to start with Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Now, as everyone knows this story, but I'm going to make it come alive. Here we go. Yeshua enters again into a synagogue. Can you believe it? Yeshua's habit was to go into the synagogue. Oh, my goodness. On the Sabbath even. Oh, my goodness. And it says there was a person there who had a withered hand. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath day. Look at these people's heart. They could care less about the man with the withered hand. But before we begin, I have a video that I want to show everybody. Let's try it. Hey, Merced, go ahead and come on up. This is the, we're going to play the video due to the audio. We're going to play the video first of Carlos Pena, the man running for president. And he's, it'll all be in Spanish. But after the video, Merced's going to translate. 
Okay, go ahead. Let's play the video. D uh, darken the lights a little bit. And turn the volume up. Israel! Generation de servidores! Responda a Israel! Apoya a Israel! Y como gobierno, nos comprometemos a trasladar la embajada dominicana que está en Tel Aviv y trasladarla hacia Jerusalén que es la capital eterna de Israel. Aquí está el partido que está comprometido con los valores judio-cristianos de nuestro pueblo y contra el globalismo, contra el totalitarismo, contra todo lo que se opone a nuestras tradiciones judio-cristianas, se ha levantado en la nación de Yeah, so what he's saying is, uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. <laughs> he's saying is, uh, we're committed. We're, this is a party that we're committed to, uh, to we're committed to move uh, uh, Domini the uh, Dominican embassy from Tel Aviv to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem, which is uh, the capital of Israel. And then uh, this is a generation that is committed to and supports Israel and then supports the Judeo-Christian values of, uh, of our uh, generation. So basically what we're saying is they're, they're supporting Israel. And then they're against anything that, uh, that it's uh, uh, prevent to, 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 you can, to your values, you know what I mean? So it, they're, they're supporting Israel. They're supporting Israel. And then if, if, if that's basically what they're saying, yeah. Well, thank you. Well, who? Uh, Carlos Pena, okay, he's running for president of the Dominican Republic, and I think there's like six other people that are all running. Uh, their elections, I believe, are this May. Now, I've been to the Dominican Republic, and I spoke there, and he and I are good friends. He's an ev evangelical pastor that's running for president. Uh, as you know, we have immigration problems here, okay? Well, they really do in the Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic is an island, and guess who's right next to it? Haiti. Haiti was basically founded by Muslims, okay? The Dominican Republic was basically founded by non-Muslims. And so, you know, they have this immigration problem there as well that he also has said he's gonna try to solve. Uh, but I know we have a lot of Spanish people that are watching this as well. Uh, but anyway, he's also asking if anybody wants to help support him in this race, please support him. I think next week I'll have a little, uh, his website up to help support him in this. But wouldn't it be great to have a believer who loves Israel as the president of the Dominican Republic? Now, how many of you know that we're going to Israel this September 1st through 10th? He and his wife, even if he's president, said he would be on that tour. So anyway, well, I'm just excited about uh, him and his wife being on the, this tour that's coming up. Okay. Thank you, Merced and Jill. Okay, so here we are. We're back in the Gospels. Yeshua is healing someone on the Sabbath. Talk about legalistic. Here are these people. They want to see if Yeshua is going to heal someone that's sick or has an injury so they can accuse them. That's what it says. They want to accuse them. And so Yeshua says to the man, which had the with their hand, Stand forth, okay? Now, I want you to remember that. Stand forth. And then he turns to the religious leaders and he says, is it lawful to do good on Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? But they kept their mouth shut. And when he had looked around about them with anger, he was grieved because of the hardness of their heart. He said to the man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. 
And then the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Okay. Let me ask you something. On the first reading of this, you might think, well, it sounds perfectly straightforward. Jesus does a miracle on the Sabbath. They thought it was against the law, so they wanted to kill him. Is that basically what it's saying? Okay. If we take the story as simply being an account of a miracle, don't you think the reaction of the Pharisees is kind of over the top? They want to kill him? Why would they want to kill him because he did a miracle? So that makes us wonder, there's got to be more to the story. Because they literally wanted to destroy him. So what's going on? I think their reaction is very excessive. Now, here is an even stranger view that Christianity takes when they read this. They say, well, this proves that Jesus did away with the Sabbath. He did away with the law and Jews are evil. I mean, how many of you have heard that? That proves he did away with the law. Total insanity. What is going on, Yeshua is turning this into a teaching opportunity, which is, after all, what you're supposed to do in the synagogue on the Sabbath. They're saying, oh, you want to cover Moses? Okay, let's cover Moses, he says. So what I'm going to do right now is we're going to jump back into the Torah so I can further explain what actually is happening here. I'll open this up for just a moment for suggestions. Does anybody have any thought on why they would want to kill him on just because he did a miracle? Power struggle, Power struggle? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't they think killing is wrong too? <laughs> you know, that's what they wanted to do. I, I think that was one of the laws. I didn't hear? Okay, it's about the pocketbook. Well, let me, let me go over this. Let's, let's w start from the beginning. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Don't you think we ought to see what Moses had to say and what God had to say to Moses to get their opinion? And verse one through four, it says you're supposed to love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments, always. Part of the problem is we think these were all just for the Jews. These aren't the Jewish commandments. These are his commandments. These are his statutes. And it says that, know this day, I'm speaking not with your children, which haven't known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, his stretched out arm, his miracles, his acts, which he did right in the middle of Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt and to all of his land. And what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses, their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued after you and how the Lord had destroyed them. Here they wanted to destroy Yeshua. They need to recognize how Yeshua destroyed all of his enemies. Let's look at verse 26 to 28. God says, behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey and the curse if you do not obey the commandments. Okay, so let me uh, bring this up. Okay, here's the question. You have the Sabbath. Is the Sabbath meant for life or death? Good or evil? Blessing or cursing? All right, and then it says in Exodus 14, 13, Moses said to the people when they're at the Red Sea, let me put them out the Red Sea. Here he is. And he says, I set before you this day. Uh, no, he says, stand still. Notice that. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians, if you have seen today, you'll see them again no more forever. The Lord is going to fight for you and he shall hold you. All right. So we have Moses. Everyone has to stand still. He's to stretch out his hand. This is a Sabbath, believe it or not. And the Egyptians all have hard hearts, we know. Now, look at Deuteronomy 30, yeah, 15 through 18. He sets before them life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Wow, look at this first commandment. It's really tough. You have to love the Lord. Well, oh, that's a hard one. I'm glad he did away with all these laws in the Old Testament. 
Okay, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, then you'll live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of. But if your hearts turn away and you won't hear and you're drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I'm telling you today, you're going to perish. You will not live long in the land which you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. All the commandments were meant to live. Today, most people think the commandments are to kill you. No, the commandments are to allow you to live. Now, this goes back to our Torah portion and a little bit before and after, but look at Exodus 5.1. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, what? Okay, I got Pharaoh here. He's got all the Israelis locked up in Egypt and God is telling him, let my people go. Now, two chapters later, Exodus 7, 14 through 16, the Lord says to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning. He goes out to the water, and I want you to stand by the river's brink against him coming. And the rod, which was turned into a serpent, shall you take in your hand, and you shall go to him. Now say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto you, saying what? Let my uh, people go. God wanted him to do it voluntarily. All right. Now, notice, if you remember from last week, there were two rods. There was Moses' rod at the bush. When he threw it down, it became a serpent. But then there was Aaron's rod that he threw down in front of Pharaoh. And what did it become? A crocodile. Exactly. But now we see it's back to Moses' rod that he threw down at the bush. Okay. Now, look at... uh, let me see. That was, mm-hmm. was that Exodus 8, 1? 8, tw- okay, well, 8, 1. The Lord says to Moses again, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. See, almost every one of these plagues, it was the same thing. In verse 20, the Lord says to Moses, rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh. He comes forth to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord God, Let my people go that they may serve me. In other words, uh, you are their king. You made them slaves. Well, I'm their king and they're going to be my slaves. So it's really in his mind, he doesn't see the love. He just sees it's a battle between two gods over who's going to have the power. Uh, And same thing in Exodus 9, 1. Let my people go that they may serve me. Exodus 9, 13, another plague. The Lord says to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh and say to him, thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go so they can serve me. Look at Exodus 10, 3. Moses and Aaron come into Pharaoh and they say to him, thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Okay, what do you think God's trying to say? Oh, you guys are good. (laughs) You guys are good. Let my people go. Now, did God have the power to force him to let him go all along? Of course he did. Okay, this is why free will is so important. And this is why I spoke last week about when God hardens his heart, it's completely different when Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart and makes it hard. God hardens his heart to strengthen him to continue his free will. You know, he's saying, hey, don't give up now. I got three more plagues. Okay, so now let's watch what happens. Exodus 14. We go there now. Verse 13 and 18. Let me come uh, back to this one here. Moses says to the people, Fear ye not, and what are they to do? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he's going to show you today. The Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will see them again no more forever. The Lord is going to fight for you, and you are to just shut up. Hold your peace. And now the Lord speaks to Moses. 
And, Moses, and he says to Moses, why are you whining? Why are you crying out to me? You just told the people to one sense to stand still. Well, I'm telling you to tell them to have them go forward. Okay. He says, speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. But I want you to lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel will go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. That's what's amazing to me is the fact that it was dry ground. I don't know if you ever, you know, been through water when it's, the tide's gone out and it's all mucky and muddy. Okay, this is dry ground. That is what is such the miracle is. Okay, and then it says, and I, God says, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all of his hosts, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians will now know that I am the Lord when I've gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, his chariots, and upon his horses. So what does he say happened in Exodus 14, 21? What does Moses do? Stretch out his hand over the sea and cause the sea to go back by strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. I can't help but think of Genesis when he divided the waters above and the waters below. But look at verse 25 through 27. The, it took off their chariot wheels and they drove them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And what did the Lord say to Moses? Stretch out your hand that the waters may come again on the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon the horsemen. And so what did Moses do? Stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its strength. And when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Okay. Let's go back to our story for a minute. For the Pharisees at the time, when Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, for them, Moses was just someone whom they might use against Yeshua. But now, what did Yeshua do? He presented to them the real Moses. And guess what? This real Moses, he not only presents, he brings a question insinuating that the real Moses is totally against their imagined Moses in a way that's perfectly clear to them. So now what happens, they're struck with silence. And sometimes when you feel like an idiot, you just shut your mouth for a little bit. You ever seen people like a deer in the headlights? I, I've been, you know, sometimes I'm involved with politics, watching what's going on in the news, and someone will bring up something that the other person can't answer. And you can see the confused look in their brain. Well, so what happens? Yeshua looks around with anger. And then it says he was grieved at their hard hearts. Okay. Well, think about this. Were the Pharisees acquainted with the scriptures? Were they acquainted with Passover? I mean, it's been how many years? 1,500 years since Passover. They've been keeping the Passover every year. I mean, if, if you do a Passover with us or anybody, they talk about this. They talk about all of the plagues. They talk about crossing the Red Sea. They know the scriptures. Well, in the scripture, who has the hard heart? Pharaoh. He is telling the Pharisees they are the hard-hearted Egyptians. They're the hard-hearted Pharaoh. That's what's going on in this story, okay? And he's looking at their hard hearts. And so God tells Pharaoh through Moses to let my people go. And he's telling the Pharisees, let this child of mine go. Why do you want him? Keep him in bondage with a withered hand. Let him go. So he's playing out the whole Exodus scene in front of them. Okay, and then remember in this scenario, if the man with the withered hand, what Yeshua is doing, he's making him Moses. 
And he's telling Moses back then, he's telling this man to do what? All through the Exodus, he's saying, stretch out your hand. Here Yeshua is telling the man to stand still. And then he says, stretch out your hand. So Yeshua's playing Yahweh. Yeshua in this whole story in Mark, he's saying, okay, I'm going to be God. He's going to be Moses. And you're the hard-hearted Egyptians that won't let him go. All of a sudden, this whole story now takes on new meaning when you bring it back to the Torah. And what he, that's why they want to kill him. He's equating them to the hard-hearted people who won't let his people go. Isn't that fascinating when you look at the story like this? Now, here's the other thing. Oh, well, and guess what else? But wait, there's more. Do you know when they crossed the Red Sea? It was on the Sabbath. It was the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The first day's a Sabbath. The last day's a Sabbath. So not only Moses, Moses broke the Sabbath, God is saying, because they were all traveling, carrying stuff on the Sabbath when God redeemed them. Okay, let's... Let's watch how this unfolds. Leviticus 23, 6 through 8. On the 15th day of the same month, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. The first day is a holy convocation to do no work, but you will offer an offering made by fire to the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. You're to do no work. According to Jewish history, the first day of unleavened bread is when they left Egypt. Okay, Nisan 15, that's when they left it's a Sabbath, and they're carrying all their burdens, and they're hauling with wagons all of the tabernacle they're going to use in the wilderness. Here, they're traveling over half a mile on the Sabbath. They're carrying burdens on the Sabbath. You following me? And then on the seventh day, which is also a Sabbath, that's when they're crossing the Red Sea. Uh, so uh, here they are crossing the Red Sea they're walking on the Sabbath. They're carrying on the Sabbath, what they brought out of Egypt. They're being delivered on the Sabbath. God brings redemption and health on the Sabbath. So by bringing the Exodus story, bringing that in, Yeshua was telling them that Mo the real Moses allowed for all of these things to happen on two Sabbaths in a row, both fleeing Egypt on the first Sabbath of unleavened bread, crossing the Red Sea on the last Sabbath of unleavened bread. And the whole purpose was to bring life to the children of Israel. So he tells the Pharisees, so what would Moses do? Well, let's look at what he did. So the question is, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Well, guess what? God did both. He saved the Egyptians or he saved the Israel and he destroyed the Egyptians. He saved the lives of the Jews on the Sabbath when they crossed the Red Sea, but he also destroyed the Egyptians. It's lawful to do both on the Sabbath as far as God is, and that's what happened. But what's fascinating now, when you go back and read the, the story in the book of Mark, when he's telling the man with the withered hand, stand still, stretch forth your hand, it's because of the hardness of their hearts. This is the whole replay of the Torah portion that they're very familiar with. But see, if we're not familiar with it, we don't see the connection. This is why we have to get familiar with it. Does that make sense? Okay, and it was on the Sabbath. Man, said he saved him. Okay, here's another one. But wait, there's more. Here we go. I have down here at the bottom, you can see the Red Sea, or the Sea of Galilee, I mean. Do you see the Sea of Galilee there? Do you see Capernaum on the coast at the, on the, at the north, the top? And if you go down to the bottom left, you'll see these two little red stars around Mount Moray which is kind of like a root word of Torah, but it means a teacher. More means teacher, the Mount of Teaching. We have Shunem to the south and Nain to the north. Okay, they're both very close to each other, a couple miles. All right, and let's look at something that happened in the Bible. Uh, first off, look at your notes on Joshua 19, verse 17 and 18. It says how the fourth lot came out to Issachar for the children of Issachar according to their families, and their border was toward Jezreel and uh, Chesulot and Shunem. Is he Shunem? Okay, so that's Shunem. That was Issachar's border. 
Now look at 2 Kings 4, 8 and 9. Look what happens. It fell on a day that Elisha went to Shunem. So Elisha is right there in Shunem and there was a great woman and she was constraining him to eat some bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat bread. And she said to her husband, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. And then in verse 14 through 17, and he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi, Elisha's servant said, truly she has no child. Her husband is old. And he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, you're going to embrace a son. And she said, don't you lie to me. You know, you man of God, don't you lie to your handmaid. And, but the woman could see. She bore a son at the season that Elisha had said to her, according to the time of life. So what happens in verse 18 through 20? When the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. And he said, uh, to another lad, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him, he brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees until noon. And then what happens? He dies. And so look what happens in verse 35 through 37. He returns and he walked in the house to and fro. This is Elisha. And he went up and he stretched himself on them. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. And then he called his servant Gehazi. And he said, go call the Who? Why? Because she lives in Shunem. Okay, so he called her. And when she came in, he said, take up your son. And she went in, fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, took up her son and went out. Okay, so I want you to see what happened to the south of Mount Moray in Shunem. There was a little boy raised from the dead by Elisha, right? Now, let's go. There's Shunem. I have it in circle. But now from there, we're going to run up to Capernaum. And let's look at another story. This is in Luke. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. After he had finished speaking in the hearing of the people, Yeshua entered into Capernaum. And there was a centurion servant who was dear to him. He was sick at the point of death. He heard about Yeshua. He sent to him and Jewish elders asking him to come and save his servant. When they came to Yeshua, they begged him earnestly saying, he is worthy for you to do this for him for he loves our nation and he built our synagogue. He's wealthy too. Okay, so what happens in verse 6 and 7? Yeshua went in with them. When he was now not too far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. Even what they said, I'm still not worthy. I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Therefore, I didn't even think myself worthy to come to you. But you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And then at 9 through 12, Yeshua heard all this. He marveled and he turned to the multitude and said, I tell you, I haven't found such great faith, not in all of Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found that the servant had been sick as well. Now, here we go. It happened soon afterwards that he went to a city called what? Okay, so you can see at the map, he's clear up at Capernaum. He's now headed down to Nain, which is the other side of the hill. You know, oftentimes when a famous person is a city, they always say, this is the home of this president, or this is the home of this Olympian, or whatever. I can just see Shunem, this is where Elisha held the servant, you know. Well, now it's on the other side of the mountain, and it's now Nain. Now, look at this. It says... Many, many of his disciples with a great multitude went with him. So how many are with Yeshua when he's going from Capernaum to Nain? And a great multitude. I mean, many, 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 many. Now, when he drew near to the gate of the city, a gate, not many great multitude can go through the gate at once, Right? There's a picture, this vast multitude of thousands of people coming and there's a little narrow gate and they're near the gate of the city and behold, there's a dead person who's being carried out of the gate. The only son of his mother and she was a widow. We just got done reading about a story of the only son of a mother and it says, how many were with her? Many people are with her. Okay. Let's imagine a gate. Okay, here we are. There's Nain. Now, how many of you realize and remember the day when, especially if you lived in a smaller town, whenever there was a funeral procession, all the cars would stop until the funeral procession went by, right? 
That's what everyone would do. Well, that comes from Judaism. That's what the Jewish people would do. Well, so here we have a cemetery. The women would usually lead the funeral procession. Then would come the men, then the children, and then you'll see the beer at the very back where four people are carrying the casket. Okay? And back then, just like what we've experienced, everyone would stop to allow the funeral procession to go. Okay? This has been for thousands of years. But the Jews say, oh no, what happens if at the same time there's a funeral procession, there's also a wedding procession? Who stops? Here you have a great multitude of people with the wedding procession going down the street and then uh, coming another direction is a funeral. Who's, what's the protocol? Who's supposed to stop? And they say that uh, the funeral procession has to stop and the wedding procession goes first because it's all about life and not just about death. And then someone says, well, what happens if at the same time of the funeral procession, the wedding procession, there's a procession of the king of Israel? Who's supposed to stop? Okay, this is why their Jews are lawyers. They, I mean, they always go through all these different scenarios, you know, long ago. And they decide, well, Everyone has to stop for the king of Israel. Everybody has to stop for the king of Israel. And then the wedding procession would go, and then the funeral procession would go. So here we have this funeral procession headed, and then all of a sudden, here comes the wedding procession, and then here comes the procession of the king of Israel. Why don't we clash, right? So she was bringing many, many people into the gate. At the same time, many, many people are trying to go out the gate to the cemetery. Who stops? Who stops? See, this is when you understand Judaism and how it works and their protocol, all these stories take on whole new meanings. Look at this. It goes on to say in Luke 7, 13, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and he said to her, don't cry. Now the women are at the front of the funeral procession. They're not at the back. The dead bodies clear at the back. And look at what it says in verse 14 through 17. He came near, so he walks the whole procession down. He goes to the back and he touches the coffin and the bearers stood still because the king of Israel gets to go first. They're recognizing him and his procession as one of the king of Israel. This is why they stop. And he said, young man, I tell you, arise. And he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he gave him to his mother. He says, don't fear. And they all glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. And the report went out concerning him in the whole of Judea and in all the surrounding region. So here he is. And guess what? the funeral procession stopped and he went clear from the front to the back and healed the child because they recognized he was the king of Israel. All right, with that, let's stand.